This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible by our sponsors, NAVAC and NAVACglobal.com. You can find all the great NAVAC tools by going to truetechtools.com and use the offer code GETSCHOOLED for a great discount. Also, Air Oasis. You can find out more at airoasis.com. They are makers of the bipolar and nano air purifier units made in the USA right in Amarillo, Texas. Also, thank you, as always, to Refrigeration Technologies at refrigetech.com. Today we're talking about refrigeration, and in refrigeration systems we find that there's a lot of times that you want to use a little bit of thread sealant, especially on pipe thread. Nylog is great for use, especially on pipe threads, as a little bit of a sealant and assembly lubricant. Find out more by going to refrigetech.com. And finally, Carrier and Carrier.com, who has partnered with us from the very beginning. Thank you to Carrier. And now the man who thought dad jokes were funny before it was cool. Wait, it's still not cool? Brian Orr. Hey, hey, hey. Yes, today it's a special day. I have been chasing Rusty Walker since the very beginning. Jeremy Smith, who's been on the podcast several times and has written a lot of great articles for HVACRschool.com, recommended that I talk to Rusty about CO2. He said he was one of the best educators out there on the topic, and I have been chasing him down for a long time. And finally, he shot me an email and said he was ready to come on the podcast. So big thanks to Rusty for doing this. And we're going to be talking about the three flavors of CO2. So here we go. Rusty Walker. Thanks for coming on, Rusty. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started into what we're going to talk about today, which is the three flavors of CO2, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you work and what you do. I originally started at, at Bone. I was a lab engineer at Bone and became, uh, went to Hill Phoenix. I currently are in the corporate trainer. I guess I'm an engineer out to pasture. So now I'm just going around teaching and trying to help contractors understand anything from basic refrigeration and basic electricity to CO2 booster systems. All right. So what does that job entail day in and day out? Mostly what that entails is going from contractor to contractor as they begin to work on different systems. The problem in our industry, as we all know now, is we're not experiencing, not getting a lot of young people in. So there's a new need to go out and teach some of these things at the contractor's level. If a contractor gets one of these new CO2 works, I spend most of my time on. I'd go out there. I help with startups. Uh, I do the classroom teaching so that we can have a better understanding. So when we're out there in the middle of the night, we're not as lost as we were. We were trying to really get this as a mainstream product and trying to get guys on top of the curve and just spend a lot of time talking and teaching them. So for those technicians who maybe don't know much about Hill Phoenix and what Hill Phoenix manufactures or sells, what type of products are included in their lines? Hill Phoenix is one of the leading manufacturers of not only cases for supermarket, but we also manufacture large refrigeration racks for commercial use. We run everything from R22 still to 448, a lot of 449 now with the changing in the refrigerants. And we're the leading manufacturer in the North America of CO2 products. And we're moving again into propane. Okay, before we get into CO2, because you just threw that propane thing out there, my understanding of propane is, is that propane is only in really small stuff. So how does propane work in the larger grocery store segment? Well, we're still not ready to use it because of legislation and the limitation on how much we can use. So we are moving into it in the small cases. So for a self-contained case, a grab-and-go case, that we can put anything from one and a half ounces to the maximum limit of five ounces. So this gives us the ability to take that off the rack and put it into the smaller. We can even put it in the C stores. We can put it in the small footprint stores so that we can eventually move more and more away from HFCs and HFOs. Eventually, hopefully, we can start using propane in cascade systems, but that we're not quite there yet based on UL and the limit of 150 grams. So the move is towards naturals, and propane would be considered to be a natural. CO2 is definitely a natural. Mm -hmm. Start by just going over a little bit of the history of CO2 and its use in our industry. Well, CO2 is actually one of our oldest refrigerants, first patented in about 1850. It was one of the top refrigerants, one of the main refrigerants used at the turn of the century, along with ammonia, sulfur dioxide, methyl chloride, and some of these very toxic gases. 
And what happened is there was a period where we had a lot of people getting killed because of the toxicity of the other methyl chlorides and the sulfur dioxides. CO2, so then in the 1930s, GM patented um, R12. And once they patented R12 and we got this low pressure, non-toxic, non-lethal gas, all the other refrigerants except for ammonia kind of went away. And so the industry, GM sold that patent to DuPont. DuPont called it Freon. Then we came up with 502 and 22. And so all the natural refrigerants, they kind of went away because we had these low cost, safe, refrigerants, synthetic refrigerants. So all the natural refrigerants kind of went away. Then when we started noticing the ozone depletion, we had a hole in the ozone, skin cancer rates went up and whatever. So uh, there was a new push to come up with something that was just as efficient, but was more environmentally friendly than the synthetics. We started looking back at CO2 in the probably early 80s started seeing what it is. It has better latent heat capacities and a lot of these gases has zero ozone depletion. So as we moved away from the chlorinated gases, the R12s, the 502s, the 22s, we came up with the HFCs, but then we noticed the HFCs had high global warming potentials. So we continued to move and look at the natural refrigerants. And now we're finding that the BTUs, the capacities are better with CO2. The cost is a lot less with CO2. And what I really push is everybody always thinks the CO2 is an environmentally friendly refrigerant, which it is has a GWP of one. It's the base, which we rate all of our CO2s against. But the really good benefit is the low cost of the gas. It's running 50 cents to $2 a pound, depends on where you live geographically. And the other thing is the BTUs per pound. I have a latent capacity of 129 BTUs per pound with CO2, comparing that to 448, which is around 97 BTUs per pound. And the easiest way to do that is, and I always challenge the technicians when I do a a training class is, what I want you to do is start looking at the liquid lines. When you go inside the store and you go into the cases and notice how small your liquid lines are, you're going to see a three-eighths liquid line on a 12-foot case, where when you start using your HFOs or your HFCs, you're going to see a half-inch, five-eighths liquid line. And that just tells me quite simply that I don't need as much refrigerant, I don't need as much gas to do the same amount of work, because the BTUs in the case doesn't change. So if I can deliver less gas, it just shows I'm doing more work with that gas. That's kind of how CO2 came back. It was driven by ozone depletion. It was driven by global warming. But now that once it's here, the capacity is really what drives it and the low cost, of course. I want to add in a couple opinions here real quick so the listeners know that when I'm giving an opinion, I want to caveat it that this is not like solid fact necessarily. But there's so much talk in our industry by technicians where they think global warming stuff is BS or whatever, and they get all worked up about that. But there's so many reasons to be excited about CO2 that have nothing to do with that side of it. Obviously, that's a big reason, and that's why it's kind of got the ball rolling. But one of the big reasons is, is that CO2 does require skill to work with. And as guys talk about, you know, oh, they're taking the skill out of the trade, they're dumbing everything down. Well, CO2 is something that there is some additional things that you got to know. It's a good refrigerant for people who know what they're doing, which I think is kind of a good thing for the trade. But the other thing is, like you mentioned, it's a really good refrigerant and it has low production costs. So when you think about being tied to other countries to bring in our refrigerants and for our raw materials, CO2 is something that we can do right here in the U.S. It's very simple. It's inexpensive. We don't have to worry about it for years and years to come from an environmental impact standpoint. And it really kind of brings home a lot of the skill that it takes to do the job and also the U.S. manufacturing side. I think there's a lot of things to like about it. Yeah, there's some challenges, but we're going to talk today about how some of these challenges are being overcome. Okay. Do you have any comments on that? I agree with that. It does take some getting used to. And one of the biggest problems I find with technicians is the Internet. Because they read all these different things, they go on these different blogs, and they start thinking that CO2 is something that it really is not. Because at the end of the day, most of these systems are just another refrigerant. It's just another DX refrigerant, especially when I'm talking about Cascade or booster systems. It's just another refrigerant that happens to run at a higher pressure and has a high triple point. All right. So before we go into the three flavors, let's just address quickly that high triple point thing. We're going to talk about this in some future podcasts where we'll go into more deeply, but there's a couple things you got to know about CO2 when you first start working with it. Triple point is one of them. So what's the abbreviated version of that? 
Real quick, triple point just quite simply says that every gas will have a point where that'll be in all three states, both liquid vapor and solid, all three. With CO2, the triple point is at 60 PSIG. So if I'm servicing a case and I allow the pressure to drop down to 60 pounds, 60 pounds gauge, any liquid that's in that evaporator or in that receiver or wherever will turn immediately into dry ice. So the key is just quite simply how to get rid of the gas, how to boil off the liquid before I hit that 60 pounds. In another podcast, we'll go ahead and cover that. The other kind of side of it is the high limit. Talk a little bit about that when it comes to the uh, supercritical fluid side. What's the quick Cliff Notes version of that? CO2 has a very low critical point, a high triple point and a low critical point. The critical point of CO2 is going to run around 87 degrees. Once I reach 87, if I looked at my pressure enthalpy diagram, when we say it becomes a supercritical fluid, there's no more relationship, pressure temperature relationship. I can't look at my PT chart and tell you what the temperature, because what happens is I go above 87 and this changes into a supercritical fluid. The densities, the liquid and vapor densities now move along the density chart and they become equal. And so once the liquid densities and the vapor densities are equal, there's no way to distinguish, is this a liquid or is this a vapor? So that's why we say it's an undefined gas. It's now super critical. And everybody wants to come up with some other term. Well, is it really superheated? No, it's not superheated because if it were superheated, that means there would be a pressure and a temperature relationship. And I could look at a saturation point and say it's above that. But since there is no saturation point because the densities are equal, the only thing I can call it is a supercritical fluid. Makes sense. So we've got the critical point at the top end, and then we got the triple point at the bottom end. What makes CO2 different than a lot of refrigerants we work with is the fact that the two of them are pretty close together. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to dive into the specifics of the three flavors of CO2. So I'm going to let you just take it from here, go down the list. What are the three flavors and what are some of the differences? All right. So the main three systems or flavors of CO2 that we have out there now, and these again are the base flavors because then on one of them, and I'll kind of touch on that a little bit, I can do some kind of a hybrid and we'll talk about that as well. But the main flavors are the first one we started doing in 2006 was CO2 secondary. With CO2 secondary, I call this a gateway system in a way. It gets us to the booster because with the secondary system, all we do is we have an HFO or an HFC on top, as any secondary system would do. So I'm going to have the HFO up here. I have in between the upper section of the system and the bottom section of the system, which is my CO2 portion, I have a heat exchanger. So we'll start with how the system's going to look. It's going to have a giant, large receiver. Inside that receiver is going to be both liquid and vapor CO2. This system currently that you see, currently you're going to see a lot of this in a Wegmans or you're going to see it in a Walmart. These are just a few that's chosen to secondary because I'm going to have it. It's a low temperature system. I'm running it at minus 20, which was CO2. Minus 20 is 200 pounds. So it's a low pressure system, at least in the CO2 world. So what we have is we have this giant receiver where I have liquid and vapor inside there. I'm going to come off the bottom of the receiver and I'm going to send it to a multi-stage centrifugal pump. This centrifugal pump has, when I say multi-stage, it has three separate impellers that allows me to step the pressure up across there so that I can move the fluid all the way into the evaporators. I stepped it up. I've got about a 25 pound differential across this very small centrifugal pump. I push the CO2 out. Now, I send it to each one of the evaporators. This is a looped type system. So I have a large liquid loop. And by large in CO2 numbers, that's probably seven eighths. I send the CO2 out to the evaporators in the, the, the walk-in or the cases. And for a metering device, all I have is a solenoid. I'm going to cycle that solenoid simply based on discharge air temperature. So we look at the temperature. I'm trying to run zero, minus 10, minus 20. I simply open the solenoid and close it based on that temperature. Now, this is where we stole right out of the ammonia handbook. We're going to use a two-to-one overfeed system. So the pump is going to push out actually more CO2 than I'm going to boil off inside of the evaporator. So the solenoid is going to open up when the discharge air goes up. I allow liquid to come into the coil. That liquid is going to quite simply, because of the BTUs per pound, the discharge air temperature is going to drop really quick. 
the solenoid's going to cycle off, and you're going to actually see on most systems, the solenoid's going to have more off time than on time. But as that solenoid closes, I still have that liquid sitting in the coil. So as my discharge air, my fans move the air across the evaporator, the discharge comes in, any infiltration in, in like an open case in some of our stores where we have open low temp cases, we allow that air to come across the coil. That air, that load, that heat that's coming off the product, the infiltration, every time somebody opens the door, all that heat simply boils off the refrigerant. Now, our flow rate, since it's an overfeed system, is very slow. And what I'm doing is as that liquid begins to boil and becomes a vapor, I'm bringing back both liquid and vapor. We like to say it's a wet return. Quite simply, it's saturated. I have liquid vapor in both on the return line. So the return line brings that liquid vapor mixture back into the receiver where the liquid that we didn't use will fall to the bottom and be ready to be reused. But the vapor is now going to move and we have a heat exchanger, very large heat exchanger, kind of looks like a chiller heat exchanger. If you were to see it for the first time, you would think, oh my God, that looks like a chiller, very similar. But what we do is we use a thermal siphon now. So we have a line that comes off of the receiver, comes up to the inlet side on the top side of the heat exchanger. This is vapor. We're bringing this vapor. This vapor is attracted to the colder 448 or 22 or 407 that's on the other side of that heat exchanger. Now we begin to bring that in. Now the temperature drops as we begin to change state. One of the other things about CO2 is for every one degree, I have a six pound pressure drop. So I have six pounds per degree of change. So as I begin to refrigerate that refrigerant, it creates this natural siphon, a thermal siphon right out of the ammonia handbook. So we create this thermal siphon that allows the vapor to come out of the receiver into the heat exchanger, chilled, heat removed, put that heat into the upper system, the 448 or the HFO system. We put that heat over there. We condense it, if you will, and the condensed liquid or that liquid comes back into the receiver. And we quite simply send that liquid back to the evaporators. The nice thing about this is you're not going to worry about superheat. You don't have to worry about how to set the expansion valve out off. You simply control it with the solenoid. And on the upper cascade or the upper section of the system, the HFC or HFO side of the system, We've put the heat into that refrigerant, and that heat quite simply takes it from the compressors to the condenser and discharge that heat outside using the HFC or HFO refrigerant. And all that we see inside the store is the CO2. And a lot of people like this system because of the simplicity of control and the lower pressure. The whole system is going to run somewhere between 200 and 250 pounds based on load. If, of course, if I have a power outage, which we could cover later, the pressure would go up. But as a normal operation, I'm somewhere between 250 and 200 pounds based on load. So that's the second First thing that I'm thinking is, okay, maybe one of the big advantages of this is that if you really want to reduce your total HFC charge or HFO charge, this is a way to do that because now you're keeping all of the primary refrigerant inside a motor room, for example. Correct. I'm trying to draw a picture in my head. This is one of the disadvantages of a podcast because we don't have a diagram to point at. But a picture in my head is I'm thinking of this a lot like a water loop or a glycol loop system um, that we may see in an air conditioning, for example, where you're using a secondary refrigerant, which in a glycol or water loop system, that would be the secondary. And you have the primary that's then cooling it, but you're still leveraging that high heat content of latent phase change that you have in CO2. So CO2 is advantageous because you can move a lot more heat with less of it than you would with other types of mediums that were staying in a single form, right? Mm -hmm. Doing a podcast is very difficult for me because I'm usually having the graphic, but you're absolutely right. The only difference is it is actually exactly like a glycol system, except some of the differences between this and glycol on a glycol system, like we do a glycol in a supermarket using plus 20 propylene glycol. Um, the pump on that system will be on the return line, pulling the refrigerant or the glycol back from the cases. Here, we're going to have it and push. It's going to be on the supply line. It's going to push it out. The other difference is, and the biggest difference is, with glycol, I'm going to have sensible heat transfer. So I'm going to enter as a liquid. I'm going to leave as a liquid, and I should see about a 7 to 8 degree TD based on how 
Hill Phoenix designs a glycol system. Here, I'm going to get latent heat transfer because I'm going to enter as a liquid through that solenoid, and I'm quite simply boiling the refrigerant off, not sensible heat transfer where I'm entering as a liquid, leaving as a liquid. I'm getting the advantage of the latent heat transfer where I'm boiling it off, I'm absorbing the heat, and I'm changing state. All right, I'm going to take a quick second and talk to you a little bit more about refrigeration technologies. If you listen back a couple episodes, John Pastorello came on and talked about additives and systems. And if you listen to that podcast, you're going to see exactly why I love working with refrigeration technologies, because they're from the trade. For those of us who are working with our hands in the trade, you know that most of the people in the trade, they don't pull any punches, right? We don't have time to screw around. We don't want to be sold with the sizzle without having the steak. And that's what I like about refrigeration technologies. They make good, solid products that do what they're supposed to do. And one of the big things that they do, that they're supposed to do, is they make products that are non-toxic as much as possible. They make products that are safe to use, not only for technicians, but also to have in customers' homes and buildings. They make really good cleaners and chemicals. They make an excellent, even acid test kit. I didn't even realize this, but they make some excellent acid test products. And you can find out more on their website, like I mentioned, refrigetech.com. But kind of the mainstay products, the ones that I really enjoy. Big Blue, they make a low temperature Big Blue. You get the Big Blue in the spray bottle that we've all seen. And then they also have one with a swab if you prefer the swab. It's an excellent leak reactant, so bubbles for the uninitiated in the terms. It's leak reactant. That's the fancy word for it. But it's great stuff. If you've used Big Blue, you know it's great. Nylog is excellent. When we're pulling vacuums, we use it on all the seals and on the threads to help pull a deep vacuum. It can also be used as an assembly lubricant. It can be used on pipe thread and flares. Um, It really helps get a nice tight seal, helps prevent galling when you're putting metal parts together, and it's refrigerant safe. It's made from either POE or mineral oil, depending on which one you use, and so it's okay to get a little bit of it in the system. It's not going to hurt anything in comparison to some other products that you definitely would not want to get into the system. Nylog is non-hardening also, which is also an important thing if you're working on it with refrigeration. So there's a lot to like about Refrigeration Technologies products. And you can also find their products, like many of the things that I talk about here, on True Tech Tools website. So if you find it at your local supply house, that's best. But if you can't find it there, you can always go to truetechtools.com and use the offer code GETSCHOOLED for a great discount. All right, here we go. Back to Rusty. Um, You're talking about the difference between the glycol loop system and the latent heat, the additional advantages that you get by using the latent phase change with CO2. Correct. It's, you had mentioned that it was very similar to glycol, and that's true. It's just I get the advantages of latent heat transfer instead of sensible heat transfer, like on a glycol system where I'm just looking at sensible heat, grabbing sensible heat and just changing my delta T going through the evaporator. And you also mentioned that the metering device is a solenoid. Now, is it actually a metering device? Does it change diameter at all, or does it just basically open and close? It basically just opens and closes. So... It's a metering device in the fact that it allows and it meters the amount of flow in there based on discharge air temperature. So it stops and starts. So it's kind of binary. It doesn't get a change of state. They don't have pressure drop going through that. It's full ported. So it's just a metering device in the sense that it allows the CO2 to enter the coil as needed. Because remember, once it goes in there, since it's an overfeed system, it's just right out of the ammonia handbook. It's an overfeed system. That means that liquid CO2 sits there that I've allowed into it. And you could say, if you wanted, that the heat mode itself helps meter the amount of flow because as the mode and the heat comes across that coil and boils that refrigerant off and brings that liquid vapor back into the receiver, I don't have to worry about super heat because I'm not going back to a compressor. So I get a fully flooded coil. So there's liquid all the way through the coil, glycol system would have. And so I get heat transfer throughout the entire surface area of that coil. It's also interesting because you use a couple terms that are just intuitive for you, but I think a lot of techs may not know the difference. So you talk about it being circulated using a centrifugal pump and it's a pump, not a compressor because it is moving liquid and not a vapor. So it can't compress. You can't compress a liquid, at least not in any significant amount. That's why it's a pump and not a compressor. That is correct. And it's just like you mentioned for those air conditioning guys who do this air conditioning, it's the same type of pump I'm going to use there. It's a centrifugal pump, a Bell and Gossett or a Patterson pump. So the only difference here is when I say multi-stage, I have actually three impellers instead of a single impeller, and it's much, much smaller. It's a third of the size. 
And then on the primary side, another interesting thing that probably blows a lot of guys' minds, which you mentioned, is that that refrigerant, that CO2, moves through that coil or through that heat exchanger, I should say, just based on the thermal properties alone. There's no pump that's driving it through. There's nothing that's forcing it through other than the pressure drop that occurs within that heat exchanger, right? And that's correct. So here's one of the things that's critical for a technician to understand, because since I'm using that thermal siphon, if I get any little bit of non condensables in there, be it nitrogen or air, because somebody didn't purge their hose when they put the hose on the system, those non condensables are always going to go to the highest spot. And the highest spot here is going to be in that thermal siphon that comes up to the heat exchanger. So if I camp out a little bit of nitrogen or a little bit of air, then I lose that entire thermal siphon because it's, if you want to say vapor lock, you could say that because I've lost that siphon. I'm not taking that CO2 vapor in there. So those non-condensables will just sit right there. So one of the things we always look at is if you're running one of these secondary CO2 systems, if your expansion valve, and if you think about that, if I put vapor on that line, that means I've lost my load. I have no load to that heat to the evaporator on the floor, the HFC side. So the expansion valve, that's going to be an electronic expansion valve nowadays because it's mechanical hardly anymore. That expansion valve is going to begin to close down. So I will see it. I'll be looking at the controller and I can see that it's down to 10% open. And I know I have a lot more load than that. I have a lot more heat. Well, that's a quick indication to me that I've lost my load. I've lost that heat exchanger. And so since CO2 can be vented, there's no recovery, no reclaim. I can vent it. We always install an access port. So I quite simply just open that access port and vent out any non-condensables that I have in there. So I'm going to go in there. I'm going to purge it. I'm going to get good purge on it. Then I'm going to close that valve. And then I'm going to look over and see the expansion valve begin to load back up as that thermal siphon is reestablished. And I now have load to the HFC or HFO side of it. The expansion valve on the HFC side will begin to load up. It'll be open up and I'll start bringing my CO2 temperature down. Because the first thing that would gotten you out there is it's going to be cases run the warm, of course. And you're going to walk in there and you're going to see your vessel pressure at 300 pounds, 350. Well, the first thing you're going to say is I've lost my load. I've lost one of those heat exchangers. And so you're going to start looking at those expansion valves and then you're going to see one or more of them only showing 10 or 20% open. And that's going to be your indication that, hey, I probably have non condensables Talking about this, it reminds me, it's not exactly the same, but it reminds me when we're talking about thermal cycling and the sort of lock that you get. I remember back in the old days, my grandpa used to tell me if you had one of those ammonia refrigerators in your RV or whatever, he said, you know, what you do to fix those if they stop working is you shut them off, you turn them upside down, let them sit for 24 hours, and then set them upright again and light them and then they'll work. It just kind of reminds me of that. We're just not used to seeing these types of systems, at least most of us in the industry, that mm-hmm. just use thermal cycling, just use heat essentially as the engine to drive that refrigerant around. But it's a very interesting system. And as you mentioned, it's beautiful to be able to vent the CO2 because now you can easily remove those non-condensables without having to worry like we normally do. And again, I always like to tell people, if you really want to get a handle on this particular system, half of it comes right out of the So the ammonia guys are like, oh yeah, I'm good. Because uh, thermal siphons and the overfeed systems come right out of the ammonia handbook. So that's an interesting thing if you want to go to research it a little more, just look on some of the ammonia books. That settles type number one, which is the secondary system, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What's the next flavor? So the next one is our cascade system. We've been doing cascade refrigeration for hundreds of years. Well, probably not that long. But so what I have is like by definition, a cascade system is two complete refrigeration systems tied together at a single point. So I'm going to have an HFC. I'm going to have an HFO system. That's going to be, let's say, 448 or whatever the refrigerant is. And it's going to have a compressor, a condenser, a receiver, an expansion valve. It's going to have an evaporator. And then back to the compressor. On the lower cascade, which is going to be my CO2 side, of course, it has a CO2 compressor. It has a condenser. It has a receiver. It's going to have expansion valves out of the cases. It's going to have evaporators. That's going to be my case load or my walk-in load. And then I'm going to bring that superheated vapor back to the compressor. So what you want to picture in your head are taking these two systems. And let's put a heat exchanger in between the two systems. Let's put a brace plate heat exchanger. And on one side, just like on the secondary side, there's going to be my 404 or my 448. And that's going to have an expansion valve 
And that is the evaporator to the upper cascade. The heat exchanger is the evaporator for the upper cascade. The other side of that heat exchanger is a condenser. It's the condenser for the lower cascade. So that's why we call that heat exchanger, our term for it is going to be the evaporator condenser because it's on one side of it's the low side for the upper cascade. And on the other side, it's going to be the CO2 that's being condensed and it's going to be the condenser. So now that I kind of set the stage here, I think it's easier to understand if we start on the lower cascade. The lower cascade is the refrigerant that's going out into the store. It's what's going to be removing the heat from my cases, from my walk-in, and I'm going to use that as CO2. That's typically a cascade system. doesn't have to be, but typically our, when we manufacture these, we use CO2 as the lower cascade or the low temp system. So I'm going to run it again at minus 20. Minus 20 is 200 pounds. It's, we can get that on our PT chart. The compressor is going to compress. It's going to run. It's either going to be a Copeland scroll or a Bitzer reset. Those are the only two that we typically use in the U.S. So I take this, I compress the gas, just like any compressor ever designed. The only thing different, if I were to open and pull the heads on this compressor, is I'm going to see pistons for a low temperature system like this. I'm going to see pistons that are the size of a, maybe a little bigger than a quarter. Because of the sweat volumes and the latent capacity of the gas, I don't have nearly the size compressors that I would for a normal DX system. And, the, and also, I imagine your compression ratios are going to be pretty low in comparison with other types of refrigeration because you're so accurately controlling that condensing temperature, right? That's exactly right. So I don't see a lot of fluctuation. So it's a very stable compression ratio. Because when I discharge out of here and I send it up to that heat exchanger, that heat exchanger, the upper cascade, is going to be running at about a plus 15-ish because I only have a four degree TV with CO2, not a 10 degree TV. So I'm going to run that at a 15 degree saturated on the upper cascade, which is going to allow me to condense the CO2 at a plus 20. Nice thing about that is everybody's always concerned about pressure with CO2 and they hear all these horror stories and unfortunately they read it on the internet. But here I'm going to condense it plus 20. Plus 20 is 400 pounds. So I am going to compress around 400, and that's going to vary based on load a little bit. But since the load of the upper cascade is relatively stable, I'm going to be somewhere between, let's say, plus 18 and maybe plus 22 at max. You're not going to see that ambient temperature that the upper cascade will see. So I condense at plus 20. I bring in a superheated discharge vapor go through there. The expansion valve is going to open. It is the load for the evaporator, so it'll open up. The electronic expansion valve on the HFC side will open up. He will begin to remove heat out of it, condense it into a liquid. I now send that liquid CO2 at plus 20 into my receiver, like I would on any other system. When I approach it from a service standpoint, I want to approach it as a normal DX system with a little higher pressure. I'm going to go through a heat exchanger, an inline heat exchanger between the liquid and the suction on the lower cascade. I send that subcooled liquid. Now I send it into an electronic expansion valve. Now, there are no mechanical valves in CO2. None of the CO2 systems, I don't even know if there's one that exists anywhere. And I don't think anybody's ever going to design one because like it or not, the mechanical valve is going to go the way of the dodo. So I have this electronic valve. I can either use a pulse valve which is manufactured by Danfoss primarily, but Sporland's just released a, their own pulse valve. Typically, those valves are going to have a six-second window. They're going to look at for superheat through the case controllers. They're going to say, I need 100% of the valve for six seconds. I'm going to be open. If I need 50% of that valve based on superheat, then I need 50% of that valve on the pulse valves. I'm going to be open for three seconds, off for three seconds. On a stepper valve, a spoiling stepper valve, it's simply going to drive that auger screw, if you will, 2% open. How many steps do I need to open up or close based on superheat? Because when I leave the case here, I have a liquid line and a suction line, not a supply and a return like I did on the secondary. So now coming out of the evaporator, I need to have that superheat. I need to have that 8 to 10 degree superheat so that I bring that suction back into my low temperature CO2 compressors. Like you said earlier, I can't compress liquid, at least not very long. 
And so I need to make sure I have super heat for the protection of the compressor. So I bring that 10 degrees, about 30 degrees back at the compressor based on what Bitzer tells us. Bring that suction back, that superheated suction back to the compressor. I compress it again, back to the condenser, and I have a nice little DX system. On the upper cascade system, on the other side of that heat exchanger, I have an expansion valve that's going to open up as the load and the heat from the condensing from those lower cascade compressors enter that heat exchanger. The upper cascade expansion valves open. Again, control superheat once they open and allow, make sure that I have superheated vapor going back to my upper cascade compressors. Again, those could be Bitzer, those could be Copeland recips or scrolls. When I do CO2, Copeland really doesn't have, or Emerson really doesn't have a recip for CO2, but on the upper cascade, I quite simply could use Copeland recips, Bitzer or scrolls. And then I go to that, I take the heat, that I've picked up in the lower cascade. I bring it into my compressors, compress the gas, take it to my air-cooled or adiabatic or whatever condenser I want to have, discharge the heat, condense that superheated vapor back into a liquid, send it to the receiver to another heat, just a little bitty inline heat exchanger, get a little subcooling, a little superheat, back to the electronic expansion valve, and there I go. And that's the DX CO2 cascade system in a nutshell. Yeah, it seems like really simple, honestly. I mean, once you get over the idea that you have this heat exchanger that is simultaneously the evaporator for the upper cascade and the condenser for the lower cascade, after that, everything kind of falls into place. The upper cascade is like every other system we've ever seen. I mean, it's got, like you mentioned, air-cooled condensers or water-cooled or adiabatic or whatever. So that there's some variance there, but the refrigerants we're used to seeing, all of that is the same. On the CO2 side, we're essentially just running a really low or very controlled compression ratio. Uh, just doing the math in my head, it sounds like it'd be between two to one, three to one compression ratios, which mm-hmm. means that those compressors are going to run really efficiently. They're not going to have to have, like you mentioned, they're going to really small cylinders in them. It kind of falls into place and it makes sense because now you're moving CO2 out into the store. Most of your charge is going to be CO2. And you're going to have a much smaller upper cascade refrigerant charge, which is useful because now you don't have to worry about chasing that all down throughout a store, especially when it's a controlled refrigerant. And that's, again, one of the goals here. One of the goals for all of these systems, the first two anyway, is how do I reduce, if I'm not prepared to go to the higher pressure booster type systems, then how do I reduce the amount of HFCs and HFOs? How can I get that as low as I can? try to comply with some of the EPA regulations, some of the things that's going on in California. And that's where it starts. But then once you get used to it, and one of the things I always tell technicians when they walk into a CO2 store, especially when they've not seen one, the first thing I always like to tell them is to breathe. It's not that different, dude. We haven't changed laws of thermodynamic, and it's just like you said. It's very simple. It's just a DX system with a little bit higher pressure. And if you want to think of it as a water-cooled or refrigerant-cooled condenser. Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. A refrigerant-cooled condenser. Yeah, that is exactly what it is. So anything else to hit on the basics of Cascade before we move on to Booster? It's a really clean system. And I'm going to come back to the secondary and DX after we do the booster, because I like to introduce to what you're going to start seeing in Florida. Publix has already started moving to this hybrid system. And if we can, we'll come back and visit that after we do the booster. All right. So let's jump right into booster then, because this is a little bit more complicated. I like to think of this system as a sexy system, because this is where you're going to separate the boys and the men as far as technicians go. This is where you have to pay attention. And this is where I live now, because there's so many customers, all these Trader Joe's, just everybody is moving to this system. Because let's start with why would you do this system? Why would you go to a booster versus the other two? The other two are simpler, lower pressure. But now with booster, I have zero. HFC or HFO. I never have to retrofit this system. I never have to revisit this system. You're not going to get better than a global warming number of one and an ozone depleting number better than zero. It's still one of the better performing refrigerants because of its latent capacity. So you always hear the salesman and other people say this is a future proof system because I am not going to have to retrofit this. That's my sales speed, maybe, I guess. Maybe I buy it. Where do I sign, Rusty? <laughs> yeah, see, I'm not only, I'm not only <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid, I'm making the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Absolutely. So, since I can't really show a picture, what I'm going to do is kind of give you a little bit of a visual. And as we go through this, for those of you who've worked on a Carlisle two-stage compressor, 
where I have that inner stage where I bring the suction in and then I compress it once and then I compress it again by sending that inner stage discharge into the suction of the other set of headers. If you've done that before, kind of keep that in your head. So I always like to start at the upper side, the high side of this, and that's going to be, so I have a series of medium temp compressors. I'm going to take one of our smaller systems that has two medium temp, it's what we call a two by two. It has two medium temp compressors, two low temp compressors. I have these two Bitzer or Copeland. No, on this one, on the medium temp, it's going to have to be Bitzer. That's the only compressors we have in the U.S. right now for the medium temp transcritical state. I come out of here and I discharge out of these compressors. I'm still using PLE oil like you did on the other two. I haven't added any kind of exotic weird oil. It's still going to be the Bitzer approved PLE oil. I'm going to send that oil out of the compressor. I'm going to send it to... Uh, oil separator. Now, I like to think of the system as operating in three modes. So I'll try to go through all three modes very quickly, and then maybe we can revisit it later. But let's say mode one, it's 41 degree ambient between, say, 77, 78 degrees ambient drop light. So I come out of the oil separator and I go to, it's 70 degrees right now. That's what we're going to do for our discussion. So I send it out at 70 degrees. I'm going to run at a fairly low pressure of 930-ish pounds. And once you get used to CO2 and booster systems, 938 pounds, you're like, ah, no biggie. It's a low pressure. Inside the copper here, now I'm going to use high-pressure copper, which is going to be about 10% steel, but the rest of it's copper. So it's heavier, but it's rated at over 2,000 pounds. I come out of the compressors. I go into my condenser. It is a condenser right now because I'm entering it with superheated vapor. That condenser could be air-cooled. It could be adiabatic. could be water-cooled, whatever. I send it into that condenser. Since it's a condenser, that means my fans are running. I'm cycling my fans. And leaving that condenser, I have a sub-cooled liquid. I come out of there through the drop leg or the liquid line, come through there into what we call a high-pressure control valve. This is a valve specifically for these systems, and it begins to help me regulate, all right? It's going to operate in three different modes. It has its own controller that is going to manipulate it, and this controller is going to look at drop leg temperature and drop leg pressure. So that's liquid coming out of the condenser. So if I can read liquid pressure and liquid temperature, I can calculate subcooling. So this valve, what is it going to regulate in this mode one? It's going to regulate subcooling. It's going to regulate the liquid coming out of that condenser to give me three to five degrees of subcooling, leaving that condenser. It has to leave it in there a little bit to help cool and the fans running across it. So it's subcooled when it leaves. That's what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to go through that valve, that metering valve, and I'm going to go into a flash tank. But think of the flash tank as a receiver. So I'm going to enter into that flash tank or receiver at, what I say, 930 pounds. Well, my evaporators are only good for 650 pounds. So I can't send that liquid out of that receiver into the store. So off the top of that receiver, I have a flash gas bypass valve. And what this valve is going to do, the same little controller, same Danfoss controller that is controlling the high pressure control valve is going to control a flash gas bypass valve, a CCM valve. That valve is going to regulate because my controller says, okay, I want 500 pounds or 33 degree liquid in that receiver coming out of the receiver into the store. As the pressure goes up in that receiver, I will open that flash gas. That flash gas is the inlet goes to the receiver. The outlet simply dumps into the medium temp suction which is going to run at plus 20 or 400 pounds. So I have plenty of pressure drop. So this is a stepper valve. The CCM valve is a stepper valve. As the pressure in the receiver goes up, this valve opens up and dumps whatever vapor. It's on the top of it, so I only get vapor, and I allow the vapor to enter into the suction. So think of it as load onto the medium temp suction. So I've now managed the pressure in this receiver at 500 pounds. 33 degrees if I look at my PT chart. Then I allow, it's a loop system. So I come off, I send all my liquid out the loop. I have branch circuits that are going to feed both my medium temp cases and my low temperature cases. 
on these cases, on each one. So I've got this nice, cool, beautiful liquid CO2 headed to my cases at 500 pounds. And let's start at the low temp. I go to the low temperature cases. I have an electronic expansion valve. It could be a stepper or it could be a pulse, just like on the Cascade, the exact same expansion valves I use on the Cascade. I'm going to monitor each case has its own case controller. And this case controller is going to look at discharge air to open the valve up. Once the valve opens up, it now becomes a superheat controller. It's going to control to 10 degrees of superheat. So now I bring that vapor. Low temp is going to run nominally, of course, minus 20, 200 pounds. I run that system at 200 pounds, minus 20. I operate the expansion valve so that I have about 8 degrees of superheat, leaving those evaporators. I come back through an inline heat exchanger, maybe pick up a little more superheat. I come back to my compressors, uh, come back to those compressors, 30 to 40 degrees of superheat into the low temperature reciprocating or scroll compressors. Those could either be scrolls or recips on the subcritical lower temperature compressors. I discharge that out of there. So I'm running at minus 2,200 pounds. I discharge. Now here's where you have to try to picture this system a little differently. So the discharge goes, I discharge this gas into the medium temp suction. Medium temp suction is running at plus 20. So again, my compression ratios are low, my compressors are low, and I'm running a plus 20 discharge and a minus 20 suction. Okay, so 200 and 400 pounds if you want to talk pressure. But I always like to talk temperature because pressure to me is just insignificant because it's really temperature that I'm trying to control. Temperature of the case, temperature of my suction line, super heat. So I've got a minus 20 and a plus 20. I take that discharge line. That discharge line is only maybe five feet because I come right off the compressor, right into the medium temp suction. So I bring that in. Now that vapor enters into my medium temp suction. So already my compressors have two loads, the vapor from the flash tank and the heat actually coming from the low temperature cases because that low temperature case and heat enters into my suction line, enters my discharge line into my medium temp suction. Now, also on my medium temp suction, the liquid we talked about earlier goes to the expansion valves on your medium temp walk-ins or your medium temp cases. Again, it's going to be a pulse or a stepper. It's going to open just like any DX electronic expansion valve would. It's going to control superheat, and it's going to take that superheated medium temp vapor back into the suction of the medium temp. So it's critical to understand that. I need to make sure, one thing that you can already figure out is when I start this up, I must, I have to start my medium temp up first. There is no starting your low temp up because if you start the low temp up, you discharge in the medium temp suction, medium temp's not running, you'll kick off on high head, high discharge pressure within 10, 15 seconds, if that. So we always start the medium temp. We always run that system. That, in a really quick nutshell, is how mode one works. Now let's talk about the sexy part of it, the part that everybody wants to always ask me about. Dude, I heard it runs at 1,200 pounds. It's scary. Okay, it could run at 1,200 pounds. So let's enter into mode two. I like to think of mode two as anything above, let's say, 78 or let's say 85 because I'm transitional between 77 and 78. That's where my fans start to go up. I haven't run super critical yet. It's 90 degrees. Critical point is 87. So now I no longer have a condenser because once I go super critical, no matter how much surface area I have, I'm not going to be able to condense that into a liquid because it's undefined gas with the same densities. So what I do is we now call it the gas cooler because all that's going to happen is my fans are going to come all the way on and I'm just going to get rid of, if I were to look at my isotherms on my pH diagram, all I'm doing is getting rid of as much heat as I possibly can. My fans are running wide out. If I'm using an adiabatic with a pre-cooler, the pre-cooler water's on. I'm doing whatever I can do to get rid of that heat. And the easiest way, I always tell technicians, if you want to know if you're super critical or not, reach over and touch with the back of your hand, touch the discharge line. It's hot. If you reach over to your drop leg and your drop leg is just as hot as your discharge or almost as hot, you're super critical because you didn't condense into a liquid. What do I do now? My controller, not the case controllers, not the controllers that are controlling everything, but the standalone little controller is going to go to the high pressure control valve. And what he begins to do is regulate that valve to be open, not 100%, but regulate that valve 
to kind of create a point where I can create, I'm going to open it to a point where once I come through there, just like a metering device or an expansion valve would, going through that valve, I drop the pressure into the receiver. The receiver's running at 500 pounds. When I go through this device, let's call it a metering device in mode two. When I go through that orifice and I create that pressure drop, I'm no longer above the enthalpy dome where I'm super critical. I've now entered back into the enthalpy chart and now I've changed it and I've changed state. And I've able to change my state, not at the condenser by cooling it, but by dropping the pressure through that high pressure control valve. And now I have liquid. It's actually going to be a saturated liquid going into the receiver. Now, of course, the flash gas bypass valve, it's 90 degrees. So I may be running at 1150. I may be running at 1200. So that flash gas bypass valve, he's going to be almost all the way open because he's taking all that high pressure vapor and he's dumping it into the medium temp suction. And to be quite honest with you, this is where when people say transcritical systems aren't as efficient, as long as I'm subcritical, as long as I can stay out of the supercritical state, I win the energy war because of my gas, my efficiencies of my gas. But once I go supercritical, of course, I'm going to lose a little bit of that energy benefits because I'm bypassing a lot of that load back into medium cap compressors. So that's why we, and when we go south and we go to Florida and we go to New Mexico and Arizona and New Orleans, then we run it through the adiabatic condensers because with those in the south, I can limit how much I run supercritical and I can stay subcritical even though the ambient is higher. So then once I enter that, I change state in the flash tank. I'm maintaining that 500 pounds in the flash tank. Everything else that I already talked about in mode one stays the same. It's that same 500 degree or 500 pound, 33 degree liquid heading the expansion valves going through the systems. The low temperature compressors, they don't change their operation at all. They have no idea the upper casket or the upper medium template supercritical because they stay subcritical because they're being condensed by the suction of the medium temp. It's perfect. So the subcritical compressors, low temperature compressors, they just do their thing. The only thing that changes is what the high pressure control valve does. It, instead of now controlling subcooling and holding that back, it now creates pressure drop. Flash gas bypass, he does the same thing. He's just farther, he's more open than he was before. So those are the two modes of operation. Let's go to the third mode. The third one mode of operation is easy. That quite simply says that my ambient temperature drops below 41 degrees. Because think about this. One of the things we do, that receiver is at 500 pounds. So I cannot allow that condenser to get below 500 or I lose pressure drop and I have no flow. So in that little controller is the EKC-326A by Dan Foss. That device says, hey, look, one of my set points is minimum condenser pressure. And we're going to say that's 560. So if the ambient temperature begins to drop, my fans start to slow down. I start turning my fans all the way off. And then in order to keep that pressure up to 560, I quite simply turn that high pressure control valve into a holdback valve. Because now he's going to be holding back that refrigerant to maintain a pressure inside of that condenser. And that pressure is going to be 560. The flash gas bypass valve, he's doing the same thing he did the last two modes, except now he's mostly closed because he has to try to keep that pressure in the receiver up by closing that valve and maintaining that 500 pounds. Again, it all goes back to that 500 pounds or 33 degrees inside the receiver. Then again, the low temperature compressors, they have no idea it's cold outside. They don't know anything changed. All they know is they had... 33 degree liquid hitting those expansion valves. They did their thing. They created their superheat. They sent it to the low temperature compressors, low temperature compressors dumped into the medium temp suction. Nothing inside the store changes. So that's basically the booster system in a nutshell. Now, if I'm running a cold ambience, I'm going to run 560 pounds on the discharge. If it's hot, it's going to be 1200 pounds. And once you get used to it, and I've not had too many mechanics tell me after they've got used to it that they didn't love this system because they never had to go out to it. And you're going to have to see that for yourself instead of believe me, that's for sure. I have this hardcore cartoon going through my head and you walked me right through it. I saw the whole thing as you were going. I think some people may not have that level of imagination. I've always been kind of a weird kid. So I could see the whole thing and all the pieces, but let's address a couple things 
that hopped into my mind and see if I'm on the right track here. So one thing that you mentioned is with the 500 PSI, I think you said that was what, 33 degrees was the liquid temperature? Yeah, th- about 33 degrees. So the first thing, obviously, you're going to have to insulate all of your liquid lines. They're going to have to all be very, very well insulated. Otherwise, you're going to have condensation like crazy. So that's one thing that jumps into my head. Yep. And that's true on all of these systems, especially since all three of these systems, that liquid line has to be insulated. If you think of the secondary system, I'm sending minus 20 liquid out to those solenoids. And CO2 is such a good refrigerant. Any place, you'll be able to tell whether to cut in the insulation because you're going to create these incredible little symmetrical what I call ice buttons. You don't want that? No, absolutely not. Our grocery store customers would not be happy with that. The other thing that you mentioned is this super critical state and everybody gets all freaky about it, like it's so crazy. But it's really, I love the way that you described, and I already forgot the name of the valve, but the valve coming back that acts as the metering device. What's the name of that valve again? The high pressure control valve. High pressure control valve. That's an easy one. The high pressure control valve, it creates a pressure drop. If you think of that like a metering device, But instead of a typical metering device, we think of it allowing us to have a flash gas on the other side, saturated liquid. We're really having a flash liquid (laughs) feeding. So we got this supercritical state where it's not really a liquid or a vapor. It doesn't really follow the rules that we're used to. As soon as that pressure drops and comes to the other side, well, now we've essentially flashed it. That's the wrong term, but a term in my head that works into a saturated liquid. Is that a good way of thinking of that? Yeah, and I really like the term flashing because that really what it is is flashing, it's changing the state, it's turning. So it wouldn't be a full column of liquid going that receiver, but like I like the way you said flashing because it's going to be saturated, it's going to be liquid vapor mixture. And to me, that makes perfect sense. As long as we just embrace the supercritical state as being this different thing that's other than that doesn't really follow the rules, then all of a sudden that all makes sense. The other word that you keep saying is adiabatic, and I think a lot of techs aren't going to know what that is, but really, if you've ever seen a swamp cooler where you're evaporating water, you're not just using water, you're actually using evaporation, that's essentially all that is, right? It's an evaporative condenser. I don't like to use the evaporative condenser because in my head, I think evaporative condenser with the water touching the coil. With adiabatic, you're absolutely right. It's nothing more than a swamp cooler. And so what I'm doing is when that air comes across this pad, what they call a pre-cooler pad, which is wet, and the coil stays dry, so I don't have to worry about treating the coil, or I don't have to worry about it any scale on the condenser itself, I'm quite simply dropping the air temperature. So I'm fooling the system by removing the heat out of the air with what I always say, that water comes through the pad and it's kind of an explosion or exchange of energy, heat energy from the air to the water. That little explosion, that transfer of heat on the other side of that pre-cooler, if I can drop that temperature, and I've seen it drop from 93 degrees in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 93 degrees, 94 degrees ambient, going through that pad and dropping it all the way to 78, that doesn't seem like much, but it still allows the system to run subcritically because I've taken that heat out. And if I continue to run subcritically and not in that supercritical state, I'm saving that energy. I'm not wasting all that energy. So it still becomes an energy efficient system as well. And so that number is 86 degrees, right? That is where you hit that supercritical state. And so as long as we can keep that condensing temperature below 86, that's where we want to be, which means that the air temperature has to be low enough below that, that there's going to be some heat transfer. Exactly right. And so this is why in the beginning, these systems were only sold up north. This is why Canada loves these systems because of their natural ambient temperature. But as we move, because in the beginning, we didn't have the BAC adiabatic. So moving to the south wasn't very energy efficient. Great refrigerant, but because I would run hot so long and be transcritical so long, it didn't make any sense. But now with the BAC, You see these already in Florida, you see them in New Orleans, you see them all over Southern California. That was really a game changer for CO2. So let's talk more about that, because the first thing my head goes to is when you think about adiabatic, I'm thinking, well, in Florida, our relative humidities are so high sometimes, and adiabatic pre-cooling requires that you have some headroom from a relative humidity standpoint. And so you had mentioned that these systems that are coming into Florida with Publix, and so would you mind talking a little bit more about that? Now, the adiabatic, the boosters, are more going to be your Trader Joe's and Aldi's in Florida. Now, if we want to talk about the next system that Publix is getting, that's going to be the hybrid of the Cascade and the secondary. All right, cool. Yeah, let's go there. What Publix has done is because they don't want to get into the booster systems like, although there's probably in Florida, I'll bet you there's about six of them. I know I've helped start three or four of them up. 
But let's talk about what Publix has done. So Publix has taken, if I can take the first two systems I talked about, the secondary and the cascade, and I can push them together, that's what they have. So what they have is they have on the upper cascade, they're going to run that at 449. Whatever we talk about cascade, that's what's happening on the upper cascade. But now on the lower cascade, what I've done is I've taken and we put this large receiver from the secondary system. We put the heat exchangers in there that are going to use the thermal siphon from secondary, and we're going to cool the gas or the CO2 down to plus 20. The vessel now, instead of running at 200 pounds at minus 20, I'm going to run that vessel at plus 20. So then I come out of that vessel on the secondary, come out the supply line. I have my multi-stage centrifugal pump, and I push it out to the systems. Here, I have a common liquid header, or I could have a medium temp and low temp liquid header because it's 20 degree liquid going out to the cases. Low temperature branch circuits, they're going to go to the low temperature cases during the low temperature. When we do this, we actually do separate the liquid headers and medium and low temp. And so I take that liquid to the expansion valves on the low temperature because that's cascade. So I go through an expansion valve, I change state, I get superheat, I boil it off just like it did in the cascade, and I send that superheated vapor back to the low temperature compressors to be compressed. Then I'm going to take that heat out of the compressors, and I'm going to put it into the thermal siphon heat exchanger. So not only do I have the thermal siphon, but that heat exchanger also has hot gas coming from the low temperature compressors in it. So I'm handling both of those loads, the thermal siphon on the big receiver, but also the discharge line coming off the low temperature compressors. So that's how the low temperature, it it runs as a cascade. Now the medium temp, I take that 20 degree liquid and instead of having an expansion valve, I have the solenoid valves. Those solenoid on the medium temp cases are quite simply going to open up based on discharge air. I'm using a two to one overfeed So I go in there, I put more CO2 into the medium temp cases that I'm going to use, and I let it naturally boil off from the load that comes across it. There's going to be more open cases, of course, on your dairy cases, your deli cases, your produce, your single deck meats. So all that heat sits there and boils all that CO2 off, and I bring it back saturated. So the medium temp lines are always saturated. They're going to be a liquid vapor mixture. It could be based on load. It could be 50% each. It could be 80% liquid, 20% vapor, or it could be 20% vapor, 80% liquid. It all depends on load. How much am I boiling up? And then I bring that, the medium temp return, not suction, but return, that dumps right on top of that big giant receiver because it doesn't, it's not going to a compressor. It's saturated. So I wouldn't want to put it in a compressor because of the liquid entrenched inside of that. And so I quite simply push those to the secondary. I use that at medium temp, and then I use the cascade for my low temp. And so this way I can do both low and medium temp inside the store with CO2, a natural refrigerant, reduce my HFC or HFOs, keep it in the machine room and in the air cool condenser that sits on the roof, and I greatly reduce the amount of other refrigerant HFOs and HFCs that I use in there. And the majority of the refrigerants are going to be the CO2 inside the store. Very interesting. Okay, so just to kind of nail this, the reason why you can do this is because you're essentially nailing the liquid line temperature to the exact temperature that you need in the medium temp cases anyway. So you don't have to have any additional pressure drop in the medium temp cases because 20 degrees is already sort of nailing that coil temperature that you're looking for. But then you can still use that 20 degree liquid, run it through expansion valves, actually get some latent or direct expansion. I mean, either way, I guess it's direct expansion. It's just flooded versus not. And so you're kind of serving both. On the medium temp. Because remember, on the medium temp, I don't have an expansion valve. I'm just using that overfeed. So I'm boiling it off because I'm pushing the liquid out, pressurizing that liquid, pushing it out with a pump on the supply side. But on the low temperature, I have the pressure drop because the low temperature suction comes back to a compressor like a cascade. So when I op- I have 20 degree liquid feeding that expansion valve, which how cool is that? How happy is the expansion valve to have that quality of liquid going to it? So that's going to be either a step or a pulse. And I'm going to get the pressure drop from plus 20 to minus 20, which is 400 to 200 pounds. So I get that. And then on the low temp, I bring that superheated vapor back to a low temperature compressor. I can't tell you how much I've learned 
just listening to this. I mean, you've introduced a bunch of new terms to me and everything. It's really great. And it all makes sense. Now, for those of you who are listening to this, who haven't hardly done any grocery store refrigeration, you're going to be like up a creek without an oar, no pun intended, because it's just like, oh my gosh, what are all these phrases? But it all comes down to the basic refrigeration circuit. I mean, we get compressors, condensers, metering device, and evaporators. They're interacting with each other in order to hit certain target temperatures. We throw in this new idea of the critical point and the triple point that we've got to work with. We'll talk more about that in the future, but it's really interesting how all three of these work. And you've done a great job of explaining it. I mean, it all makes a lot more sense to me, which means that there's at least three other people out there who will get something out of it. (laughs) (laughs) I feel so much better now. Okay, great. I think we nailed it all. We're going to talk more about this in the future. We had a little bit of technical difficulty throughout this episode just because of some computer bugs here and there. I'm going to send Rusty a mic for the future episodes. But I would encourage you to shoot me an email, brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at hvacrschool.com. Let me know if you have any questions about this, what areas you want to go into deeper. And we're going to do kind of a whole series on this topic because it's an area where there's going to be a lot of growth. It's a big opportunity from a career standpoint. A lot of guys ask me, what should I look into specializing in in order to kind of future-proof my career? And I think CO2 is an excellent area to at least have some domain knowledge on. Obviously, like I always say on this podcast, you are not going to learn how to work on refrigeration and air conditioning by listening to a podcast. But what a podcast can do is it can open you up to resources and new ideas that you weren't previously open to. And Rusty and Hill Phoenix are obviously one of the leaders in this area. And you can go to his classes and learn more from Hill Phoenix on this. If somebody wanted to learn a little bit more from Hill Phoenix, where should they go? What I always recommend, if you're going to service, especially a booster system, you really, and all these and Trader Joe's, a lot of customers are now making it mandatory that you attend training. If you contact me on an email, I will be glad to set something up. We find that it's much better if we come to you than you come to us because we can get everybody who's going to touch the system. We can get those guys trained because my fear is always that one guy who doesn't get to go to training or has never been to training and walks out on this job site. He walks up to a booster system and he looks at it and he goes, oh my God, what the hell is this? And he's stuck and nobody will answer their phone at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and then he does something stupid that everybody regrets. (laughs) And if you want, I can give you my email address. Yeah, if you're willing to share it, that'd be great. Absolutely. It's rwalker at doverfoodretail.com. All right, rwalker at doverfoodretail.com. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm sure you'll get some requests. And as soon as we're done recording, I'm going to talk to you about that for our crew. So I really appreciate it, Rusty. I think this is going to be a great series and hopefully you all learned a lot. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you for having me on. Now, I don't know about you. Of course, I never really know about you because you're not here. I'm the one talking. You're just listening. But I learned a lot from that podcast. Now, you had to have your brain engaged. This is one of these ones sort of like some of the Jim Bergman episodes where you can't just be a passive listener. You have to really be imagining what it is that he's saying. But I actually like that. It kind of forces my brain to work. And I learned a lot from this episode, learned a lot new terms like thermal siphon. First, I thought he was saying thermal cycle, which also made sense to me, but thermal siphon, where it's moving the refrigerant through the circuit, not based on a pump or a compressor, but just through the pressure drop associated with temperature change. Pretty neat stuff. If you've ever studied ammonia, like you said, a lot of ammonia systems use that. Adiabatic pre-cooling for condensers. I knew that existed, but I didn't realize to what extent. Sounds like there's a lot of CO2 systems that use that. A lot of good stuff to know. A couple other terms that he said that I didn't really touch on, but refrigeration technicians will often refer to the liquid line where it comes down from the condenser as the drop leg or even as the drain. You'll hear them call the liquid line the drain sometimes. Those are just terms that you may want to get used to because you'll hear tech say it and be like, what the heck is that? I heard of a drain regulator and I was like, what the heck is a drain regulator? And it's just a drop leg or liquid line regulator is another way of saying that. Anyway, lots of interesting terms that are used in grocery store refrigeration, market refrigeration that you don't hear in the other segments and i'm very thankful to rusty for coming on and sharing his knowledge thank you to hill phoenix for sharing him and sharing the knowledge we need as much training as we can get and this new stuff is pretty cool stuff on another note a less positive note i don't know if you heard but a limbo champion walked into a bar he lost get it because limbo i think okay all right thanks for listening we will talk to you next time on the hvac school podcast Thanks for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. 
You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.